Thank you very much, Father Dees, for the uh, introduction, and thank you all for coming this evening, and thank you, uh, Professor Bonglia, for the invitation. My topic tonight, uh, Helping Without Hurting, uh, Leadership in Difficult Times, is going to be an opportunity for me to talk to you about difficult situations which uh, individually or historically we as a we as a people have encountered, as well as time for me to uh, answer questions from the audience. I was privileged, as uh, you heard, to serve as a state trial court judge for 21 years for the state of Minnesota. And sitting on the bench, we had the opportunity to make difficult decisions, but that was only part of the job. The other challenge was to work with other people of goodwill, to work on problems facing the court, and improve the administration of justice. Because after all, it was justice for all, not justice for a few. So we work to uh, improve access to justice, work to improve the quality of service, and work to uh, especially to provide greater, a greater voice for families who were victims of crime. Those same families, when the court proceedings were over, would continue to bear the burdens of their loss. And sometimes, when all appeals were exhausted, want to sit down and meet with the judge who presided over the case of their loved one who had been murdered. In 1992, I was asked by the U.S. government to travel to Europe for a series of lectures in Norway and Germany about Black History Month. And of course, just like here, Black History Month was in February. Uh, I traveled and had the opportunity to find a whole new avenue of relationships, meeting people who could discuss the intimate details of Minnesota politics even though they lived a continent away, and knowing that I couldn't say who their elected officials were or who their prime minister was, it just opened uh, my eyes to how much uh, I needed to learn and how much Americans needed to learn about the world. We traveled to a place called Nuremberg in Germany. And in Nuremberg is a courthouse. And at that courthouse were the historic Nuremberg trials. And one of the court reporters in the Minnesota courts had been a court reporter at Nuremberg. So the guides were able to show me some of the old archives. And I found what I believed was her photo. Her name was Marge. And she was in the US Army and uh, a reporter. We also had attorneys from Minnesota who also presided at the uh, Nuremberg trials. To see that courtroom and see the reality of, of how the nations had worked together to bring uh, charges and prosecute some of the, uh, the leaders of some of the most horrible things that had happened in our society was a, a very profound moment for me. The State Department, after I returned, uh, the State Department had me do other speaking engagements. And in 1994, I was invited to Kenya to work with a group called FIDA Kenya on women's rights. And the rights of women that we were addressing was the right to be protected from domestic abuse. And domestic abuse in Kenya was a woman being beaten uh, unconscious, a life-threatening uh, situation where uh, she would be left uh, to die and the family would carry her to the hospital. So it wasn't uh, anything that was uh, taken lightly, and it was a very serious situation that the women lawyers in the country wanted to address. There were no laws to protect women, no battered women's shelters, no judges trained in domestic violence, when the Federation of Women Lawyers of Kenya uh, asked uh, me and the others to get involved. 
And as our work progressed, it was clear that it would take a number of years to affect the changes and a number of trips to Kenya to incrementally work on each avenue of society, working with politicians, working with the courts, working with the police, and most of all, the civic education for the communities who needed the protection so that they would request these laws uh, to be put in effect. And so, in 1994, in the wake of the Rwandan genocide, a group of us got together and formulated the International Leadership Institute. We were not able to have any impact on the Rwandan genocide, but we, we stood at that moment in time and recognized that our service uh, had to extend beyond the borders of Minnesota. And so the, I contacted the State Department and talked to them about the programs I was doing in Kenya that the problems were longer than a two or three week visit, and would they mind if we started this nonprofit to run parallel to the work so that we could sustain it? And they were very agreeable. So I continued to travel around Africa as a State Department expert and continued to have the International Leadership Institute to be able to drill deeper and have uh, the long term history and involvement with these uh, organizations in Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Morocco, to name a few. The State Department later brought a woman by the name of Mary to the city of Minneapolis. Mary had been in the Rwandan military. She had been an officer. She had fought uh, side by side uh, with the other uh, Tutsi troops. Uh, to end the genocide in Rwanda, and she had been made mayor of the city of Kigali. The State Department brought her here to meet Mayor Sharon Sells Belton, who was an African-American mayor of a large city, and felt that they would have something in common and be able to talk about the responsibilities of being a mayor. We had, I was serving in the juvenile court at the time, and uh, the mayor uh, Mayor Mary was brought over to the juvenile court to see how the court operated and we were able to talk about the administration of justice in post-genocide Rwanda. And Mary looked at me as I talked to her about the courts and the cases and other things and she looked me straight in the eye as a, a seasoned soldier would do and said, we're not focusing on the trials there's not enough food to eat in Kigali, and there's not enough food for the prisoners. The international community has not supplied enough food for the victims of the genocide, and the prisoners are going to suffer as a result because there's not enough to go around. And so her problems were more immediate than the administration of justice. They were problems that were developing by the hour of how to uh, triage people who had been injured, how to deal with food supplies, and how to deal with an international uh, community who had delayed their response until disaster struck, and the response was measured and slow as it came in. My concern had focused on the courts because that was what the information I was able to obtain. I knew that the majority of judges and lawyers had been targeted for assassination during that 100 days of genocide. But what hadn't really fully developed was that over a million people had been killed in virtual hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, by their neighbors during this period. And Rwanda is a very small country and Kigali is a very compact city. So when I finally had the opportunity years later to travel to Rwanda and actually see firsthand the, uh, the institutions that were erected to the devastation and talk to people who were there shortly after or there during the genocide, 
it was it was still an overwhelming experience and will take generations for them to recover. We talked to children who witnessed their parents uh, murdered in front of them and who had to live with the killers of their parents for their own survival. And we also talked about the failure to respond by the United States and the rest of the world. Uh, the Kenya parliament debated the issue and failed to respond. That was one of their nearest neighbors with the military. And we talked about the denial, the apathy, and the indifference that caused the international community to fail to respond to Rwanda in their hour of need. And we talked also about how this denial continued and persisted until a river the size of the Mississippi was filled with bodies, shoulder to shoulder, floating into the reality that the world could not deny that it was, in fact, a genocide that was happening in Rwanda. And so when we finally got to Rwanda, the, in the International Leadership Institute goes places by invitation. And so we had an invitation to go to Rwanda to actually work with a, a pastor who was working to help uh, orphans and genocide survivors. So we had a purpose in going. I think many times uh, people go to a place where a disaster has happened and they're going to take photos. They're not going to help people. And so when we did a program recently on Somalia, uh, one of our colleagues, Nadifa Osman, had a, a video and the Somali people who were victims of the famine just kept saying on the video, you only come and take pictures. You never do anything to help us. You only come to take pictures. And so our organization goes on invitation where there's a structure where we can learn what is needed, but we have partners on the ground to work with. And it's not a photo op, it's not a pity party. It's a way to uh, see what people what their vision is for the future and what do they need and show them how to uh, make that happen. So one of the things uh, that Pastor Paul said he needed in his church in Kigali, reaching out to uh, genocide survivors, I think if you know what it would be like to grow up without your family structure, it means you're living on somebody else's couch, you don't have parents to take you in or keep you in, in hard times. You're a cabbage away from prostitution. There are a lot of things that uh, make young people very vulnerable when they grow up without a family network. So one of the things Pastor Paul wanted to do was start a, a sewing club so that the women could learn how to sew. They could make their own clothes. They could sell clothes uh, in the marketplace. And it could be a beginning of a way to have some uh, cash income. And he said, I have the sewing machines, I have the teacher, but I don't have the fabric. And so I said, where's the, where's the cotton mill? Where's the fabric mill? And he knew exactly where it was. I said, we're going to go to the fabric mill and we're going to request a donation of fabric so that your students can start out and make clothes and then have money to buy fabric in the future. So of course, with the leverage of an American going with them to the fabric mill, the Asian owners of the fabric mill were willing to make the donation. So we were able to get fabric donated, and within three days, these women had formed a club, sewed a uniform, made clothes for themselves, made clothes for their children, and had things to sell. And so that's the kind of thing people can do when that door is open. They have the skills, they have the ability, but they just need an opening to be able to step through. And when uh, we went, one of the things that many people fail to do when they go to an area that's been devastated 
is to respect and honor uh, the, pe the survivors and, and want to deeply uh, inform themselves about the past. And so our team, which was law students from William Mitchell uh, Law School, we first went to the genocide museum that had been erected in Kigali. And uh, it's uh, a world-class museum that incorporates uh, the events of the Holocaust as well as the Rwandan genocide. And when I got to uh, Kigali and got to the museum, shortly after that, I met a woman who said she was an attorney working in uh, Kigali and she was very interested that we had law students and that I was a judge. Her name was Justine. Justine is an internationally recognized human rights attorney, and she's from Rwanda. She had originally immigrated to Canada, uh, married and raised a family, and then in 1994, the genocide erupted, and she immediately went back to see after her mother and her large extended family. But when Just Justine arrived at the border, the border was sealed. And so she was not able to physically get into Rwanda until the aftermath of the genocide. And Justine was looking for her mother. And her mother uh, was disabled. She had trouble walking. And she was living alone. And so she found someone, because Rwanda is one of those places where you live and you don't change addresses so your neighbors all know you and you know your neighbors. So she found one of her neighbors and the neighbor told her, and the neighbor was a Hutu, and the neighbor told her that her mother had sought shelter in her house because they were killing all the Tutsis so she went to the Hutu home for shelter. And she was safe for a while, but then as the genocide extended, they were going house to house looking in the homes of Hutus to see if they were sheltering Tutsis. And if they found any Tutsis in the house, they would kill everyone. So this neighbor who had sheltered Justine's mother knew that this next wave was coming. And this neighbor was uh, preparing to flee for her own safety. And she and Justine's mother discussed what would they do? What should they do for her? And Justine's mother said to her neighbor and her friend, wrap me in straw mats and hide me. So the neighbor did as she requested and wrapped her up and camouflaged her in straw mats. So, and then the neighbor fled. So as the genocide worked its course, and finally uh, the militia led by Kigami was able to come in, and the uh, Justine was able to get across the border, she proceeded to look for her mother. And as she was going down the streets near her mother's home, she saw the dead laying in the street, and she heard babies crying, and babies were in the arms of their dead mothers. And she asked other people, why are you leaving these babies out here crying? Why hasn't someone rescued the babies? And in the coldness of conflict, the answer she received was, let them die like their mothers. So Justine not only was looking for her mother, but she was also collecting and rescuing babies who were facing certain death. Uh, if uh, she had not intervened. And she was literally stepping over bodies to get down the street. The streets were covered in blood and bodies. And she finally got to the neighbor's home, and she knew her mother's hiding place, and she was able to find her mother's body wrapped in the straw mats, as her neighbor had told her the story. So her mother was dead, but her mother hadn't been hacked to pieces as many uh, had faced uh, during the genocide. 
And Justine faced a, a very difficult moment as a world-class attorney able to advocate for the human rights of many, she was not able to save her mother or intervene to save uh, other members of her community. And so she decided to relocate back to Rwanda and help rebuild the country, to train new lawyers in the law school, and to focus her efforts on improving the access of justice, and particularly for, for juveniles and for the protection of victims who were testifying during the proceedings related to the genocide. There were some public uh, hearings called gachacha, where people would gather like this, and someone who had committed a, a murder against their neighbor would be called to come in front of their own neighbors and tell what they did. And if they did not tell the truth, they would not be given amnesty. And so if they had raped someone or done other harm to a woman, they also were not eligible for amnesty. So many women uh, started to disappear or be killed uh, in order for people to get amnesty. So Justine was working to provide greater protection for the victims. The, when I went to leave, I, I talked to some people that were here in Minnesota from Rwanda, and I, I made a remark. I said, I hope to go to the church where it's a genocide memorial, uh, where the bones of the dead are buried. And he whispered to me, there are many churches. And I think we found no less than 10 churches where people had sought sanctuary and were murdered in the church. So the bones of the dead are now a memorial in those churches. And they're stacked like books on shelves, tibias on one shelf, skulls on another shelf. And in some churches, instead of the pews being for the living, the pews are for the dead. The in between the pews are the books of the dead, the Bibles, the cooking utensils, the clothing that the dead people from 1994 had carried with them when they were sure that they would be protected in the church. So we're talking a thousand, two thousand, five thousand people crammed in a church and then all murdered in hand-to-hand -hand machete attacks. So it was, it was quite uh, an emotional, overwhelming experience to walk literally through the valley of the shadow of death and see ceilings covered with blood and see the... God always leaves an eyewitness, so each of these churches had a survivor that led the tour to talk about what happened and how in this chaos of killing, they were covered in the bodies of the dead and when it was safe, worked their way out to be able to live and tell the story to others. And so the, the survivors guide these tours so that you're able to have a very humble, intense experience when you go to one of these churches and understand how ordinary people can turn on each other and have this escalation of violence uh, with people that they know and share a common language. In 1939, there was a ship called the SS St. Louis carrying 930 Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany. It was not allowed to land on the coast of Florida in the United States. It was not allowed to land in Canada. Uh, these refugees were forced to return to Europe on that same ship, and many lost their lives because of the de denial, apathy, and in some cases, bold indifference. And remember, Hitler had been in power since 1933. Three years earlier, in 1936, Jesse Owens had won four gold medals at the Berlin Olympics. 
and he received a ticker tape parade in New York City. He had to take, after the ticker tape parade, he had to take the freight elevator in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel to a party given in his honor because blacks weren't allowed to use the front door or the elevator in the hotel. Uh, the same administration under Franklin Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066 on February 19th of 1942. This excluded persons of Japanese ancestry from the entire Pacific coast. Americans were, Japanese Americans were systematically dispossessed of their farms, their homes, their businesses, and their property, greatly benefiting white farmers that lived in the Pacific region. President Ronald Reagan signed legislation in 1988 and the U.S. paid $1.6 billion in reparations, citing race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. And President Reagan apologized. I repeat, apologized for uh, this era in American history. My father enlisted in the U.S. Army in World War II uh, coming from the segregated South, he joined uh, the U.S. Army with a sense of, uh, sense of patriotism and a profound hope that America would live up to its promise of we the people. And he truly believed that we the people meant liberty and justice for all. He served in a segregated unit in World War II, lining up in southern military bases to eat on the basis of color. German prisoners of war were allowed to eat first. Then African descendant soldiers were eating after the prisoners of war. He also served in Korea during the Korean conflict. And he believed that America could live up to its promise. He left the segregated South for Minnesota he marched in the March on Washington. He worked with the NAACP. He worked in his church. And he was able to see the hope that people had in this country and the willingness to hold uh, America and the world to a higher standard and the willingness to serve made a difference. So he was able to live to see many changes in the country. There was a Babylonian rabbi, Rabbi Halil the Elder, whose quotation has echoed through time. And his quotation is, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? And thousands of years ago when this was said, and hundreds of years ago when this was said, and decades ago when this was said, and days ago when this was said, it still echoes of our collective responsibility to serve all of mankind. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi once said, you must be the change you want to see in the world. And a Minnesotan named Marilyn Carlson Nelson recalled in her book, How We Lead Matter, she recalled the events of September 11th of 2001 at the Carlson Companies. And the Carlson headquarters at the World Trade Center had been hit. And she established what they call a phone bridge so that all the Carlson employees in 150 countries could be connected at once, uh, not knowing uh, what September 11th was ultimately going to be. And she gave a message to uh, this, em these employees in 150 countries to take care of each other, take care of our customers, take care of our competitors' customers, take care of your communities. And finally, she said, 
if they lost the ability to communicate, we were authorizing every Carlson employee to act according to our company's creed, which requires that all employees act with integrity, go as a leader, serve with a sense of caring, and dream with all your mind, and never give up. On September 11th of 2001, I was flying from Europe to the United States, and our plane landed at the airport, and we were told we were landing in Detroit. And the passenger next to me looked out the window, and he said, that's not Detroit. I said, so of course, you know, the lawyer and me, I'm like raising my hand to the stewardess, and I said, what airport are we in? And she said, Detroit, with this big cheerleader smile. So I knew something was wrong, ask no more questions, wait to see what's going on. And we were, in fact, in Toronto, Canada. And they had been told not to tell the passengers where we were because all the uh, planes that were in the US airspace had been diverted to other airports. And they didn't know if more planes were involved or not. So. Once we were in Toronto, and we were allowed by the Canadian Mounties to leave the, air, the airplane after about three hours, there were about 10 of us who rushed to the Northwest Airlines desk and asked for hotel vouchers. And the others went to the Avis desk and asked for a car. So. Those of us who are internationally minded know when the airspace is closed, the road is closed as well. So, so we, we got our rooms in the Radisson, which Marilyn had given instructions to treat us with luxury, which I didn't know. And we, had a, a very, we were very well cared for during the week that we were stranded in Canada. Unfortunately, others who didn't receive uh, the memo, drove to the U.S. border and were turned back, and then had to find accommodations and face all the frustration of hoping to get home or get to other commitments and not being able to do so. So it is, when you talk about six degrees of separation and three degrees of separation, it's, it's often maybe one or two degrees the fact that Marilyn Carlson Nelson uh, wrote a book called uh, How You Lead Matters, and she signed my book, Lead With Love. And we have uh, one of her best friends, Retha Clark King, here in the audience, who is another leader that I admire. And so it's, it's important that we uh, find others who can lead with a full life, with a marriage, with a family, with children, who uh, have a faith walk that sustains them during their leadership and have the opportunity to uh, walk against the wind. Thank you very much.